All of you guys are on the East Coast. I'm in Minnesota. I'm in uh, Texas. Okay. Hello, oh. everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Sip and Talk. How's everybody doing today? I'm doing good. Okay. You guys do anything exciting? I took my son to the uh, to the uh, aquarium for the first time. Okay, so oh, wow. Friday I just kind of chilled back, and then Saturday I had like a little get together for a friend that's close to me for her birthday. So we kind of you know had a little get together and chilled out yesterday, had some food and some drinks. Did you get anything into anything interesting uh, this weekend, uh, Miss Tanza? I did not. I did absolutely nothing, which is the most exciting thing in the world to do. <laughs> All right. All right. So we got a great story here for you guys today. Today we have a uh, guest interview today with Shire Ingle. Uh, she's telling her story on her situation with the Atlanta police officer, uh, Officer Wilburn, alleged, you know, rapist. So she'll be telling her story today. But to give you guys a brief history on this officer, uh, he was an officer for the Atlanta Police Department. He later then moved to the Lithonia Police Department. Uh, before moving to the Atlanta Police Department, he had allegations against him with the Atlanta Police Department. Mm -hmm. So couldn't understand why he got hired at the Lithonia Police Department. Okay. Who make I don't make the rules, but back in 2017, he was working for an apartment building as an off-duty officer that Shar moved into, and kind of got a little bit acquainted with her, and you know later on he attacked her. So I would like to show you the news clipping of that situation, and then we'll have her join us and fill us in more details on the story. So give me one second while I pull that up. All right, can you guys hear that? Yes, ma'am. Are you guys able to hear it? I can't hear it. I can see your screen, but I can't hear. Going to Messenger, I'm going to start. Bear with me, you guys. Oh, my internet is slow. Give me a second. 
Sorry about that, got it. It's okay. All right, can you guys hear now? No. No. It must be the video, it has to be. Uh, maybe yeah, it's, it's the video. I hear it now. You guys still don't hear it? I hear it just a tiny little bit. Yeah, it's it's not it's legible. Not. about now it's better okay i'm gonna start it from the beginning i apologize
All right. So we have her joining us this evening. So we're going to hear from her side to let her tell more detail. Thank you for joining us, Shar. So that was, as we watch the video that you were telling your story on how he came into your apartment and allegedly raped you. Did you know this officer beforehand? No. And how, how, so how did he, well, how was he aware of your apartment? Well, I know, like, I seen him, like, when I was walking the boys to school, to my kids to school, because I can walk there. And I seen him out there, and he was talking to, like, the workers, because he was working as an off-duty security um, to make sure that, it's like in Atlanta, like, when they do road work or street work or whatever, they always have a cop making sure that, you know, nobody hits them or anything like that. So that's what he was doing. And then finally, he just started talking to me just out of nowhere, you know, he, I guess you can tell, you can tell by the way I talk and I walk and stuff, but I'm not from there and you can actually tell that. So he just started talking to me and, and I was asking him about resources. I'm fresh in Atlanta with two kids. You know, I don't know nothing about Georgia. I'm just there trying to start a whole new life for me and my kids. I was happy. I was proud of myself, you know, cause some people don't get a chance to do that. And especially just, I already, I was going through some things before I got there, you know, through the apartment I was in, but I was still happy to stay there in Georgia and make it work regardless. Cause I just love this kid, the school my kids were going to, it was a charter school. And I loved how they're, you know, the academic there. And then plus I'm like, I love the country and I love the city. So when you put them together there, it's just beautiful. Right. So would you say that then there was some conversation that took place prior before the alleged. Yes, rape. for like three days. He three talked days. to me for three okay. days. Okay, and during the length of that, this conversation, you kind of opened up and shared some things about yourself. Yeah, I told him, you know, he asked me why I moved to Georgia, what made me pick Georgia, and, I just, and plus I told him, you know what I'm saying, you, you have, there's a lot of African-American support there. And that's one thing I wanted my boys to see. Like I wanted my, I was, I was happy for my boys to be able to see Morehouse. They seen black men with suits on and they seen them graduating. You know what I'm saying? So, and then it's a diverse there too. You know, like I wanted my kids to be able to, we lived right there next to Georgia Tech. Okay. So we was right there in the college and I wanted my kids to be able to experience all that and the history, you know what I'm saying? That your history is there. And so, so during these conversations, did you ever share any personal yes. information? Yes, he asked, yes. So he asked me why I moved there, and I told him because um, of the abuse I was going through here in Minnesota. Um, and I told him, you know, like, I wanted a fresh start. My kids have been through some things. I've been through some things. I just wanted a fresh start from everything I've been through here. Okay. And so just in those three days, yes. those were your only conversations? Yes. I mean, he talked to me. Like, he told me... Like, um, like he was talking to me and telling us, you know, he's kind of knew I was struggling because he was like, um, you only have three pairs of jeans and you're switching up your shirts with them. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I actually only had three pairs of jeans because I came to Georgia with just a bag of papers, just ready to move into the place and start over again. So basically you felt comfortable because this was an, this was a police officer, mm -hmm. which we should be able to feel comfortable because they're here to protect and to serve. Mm -hmm. So you opened up and you did share some of this information. Yeah, because he said he also he also helps single moms. He know resources. He know programs that he can give. And he's a cop, so why wouldn't you believe? So and he's from Georgia. Did he know. ever connect you with any of no, these? No, after he said he would, and he never did. And I just kept like he would stop me when I'm walking the kids to school or when I'm coming back. That's when he would talk to me because when I was in my apartment for them three, he wouldn't say nothing to me. Like he didn't knock on my door during that time or anything. So he was just literally talking to me while I was walking back and forth. Okay. And so, so then um, you mentioned when we spoke before mm -hmm. that he had given you money. Yeah. So one that the third day he gave me $40. He said, here go $20 for Jabril and here go $20 for Kai. Cause he knew their names. Mm -hmm. He like, my kids talked to him and they were, you know, my son was like, you know, he wanted to be a cop at one time. So it was, he was, 
you know, he, they trusted him too. So he gave me the $40 when I dropped them off that morning. He gave me the $40 when I came back and he was like, here go, you know, and to me, I thought it was a blessing. I'm not going to sit here and lie. I met a lot of people in Georgia before him that were God, that I felt God put in my life for blessings. Like I had a woman there who I didn't even know. And she showed up at my house with food and clothes and stuff for my kids, you know? So I'm thinking it's just a hospitality, a Georgia hospitality, right. like he's, you know, helping me out. And that's what I was really thinking. And so then after he given you this $40, when would be the next time that you saw him or spoke with him before the incident? Um, so when he gave me the $40, that was the third day. That's when he knocked on the door. And when he knocked on the door, he knocked on the door and he said, can I talk to you? I had the door open, of course, and I'm talking to him. I did not tell him to come into my house at this time. I didn't invite him in. I'm thinking so he, he just forced to yeah, He started walking towards the inside, you know, so, and I'm, I'm already kind of nervous. I'm scared. Because as a woman, you already can already tense and feel something finna happen to you. So did you feel that if you would have told him, like... If I felt if I would have told him no, I think he would have came through anyways. And so after this alleged rape, what did you do next? After he, after he came in, um, he got to walking, you know, coming in. And that's when he shut the door behind him and he locked it. And that's when he, that's when the whole conversation started changing. That's when he got more into telling me about his home life and what his wife wasn't doing and everything. So pretty much, um, he just got to be really talking to me. And then he seen the room, because if you were in my living room, the curtains are open and there's a daycare next door to it. So you can see in there. So he went in towards the bedroom and he grabbed my hand and he put me in the room. This was a one bedroom? Yes, it was in my bedroom. So it wasn't hard for him to come up on that. Um, did you report it? No, I didn't. I mean, I know he was a cop. He told me he was a cop. Um, and then I'm from Georgia. I'm not from Georgia, man. I'm from Minnesota. I'm by myself. I don't have nobody. I don't know who to talk to. My kids are in school. I He, he, he raped me not even a half hour before I had to go pick up my kids from school. So... It took me a minute to even get to their school because I was waiting for him to see. I was looking for his car. Because mm -hmm. if he would have came through the front, then everybody would have saw him. Right. I would have even saw him before he knocked on my door. He parked in the back. So I could not see him come through the back way. My windows don't face the back. My windows face the front. So um, I waited to see where he was driving from because I didn't even know he parked in the back until I seen his car park, until his car leave out the driveway. And then I seen the police pull. My heart wanted to run out there to the police, but at the same time, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of felt like it was a setup, mm -hmm. you know? And for some reason, I just felt like it was a setup. And then um, I got up and I went to go get my kids. And my son looked at me instantly and said, something's wrong with you. And I just brought him back to the one bedroom and just try to shake everything off because I don't want my kids to feel that energy on me. Right. So let's just back it up a little okay. bit. Are you comfortable uh, giving the details as to once he was in the apartment yeah. and led you to the bedroom? Yeah, because I think that's the place there. When he led me into the bedroom, um, he forced me on my knees and he grabbed me by my hair and he persisted on with the oil. Um, it was very forceful. And as he's doing it, he's talking shit about his wife. And then he um, turned me over. I'm not saying nothing. I'm just tearing up. I'm crying. I'm trying not to even be scared because sometimes if you were scary or um, you scared, scare them, they'll hurt you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to fight. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie, I wanted to fight, I wanted to kill him, I wanted to do everything sure. that, that I possibly could to hurt him. Mm -hmm. And then um, he pulled my pants down halfway, and then that's when he, um, he bent me over, and that's how he finished his thing. And then he turned me back around and put me back on my knees, and that's how he finished. And so you said you didn't report it right then. 
So when did you record it? I recorded it when we were looking. My whole time, me staying there now, my kids came back to Minnesota. My, my, my job was to stay there. I kept trying to find him, but I also had to live my life. So, like, I went and got a job, but I always watched. So he, when you say find him, I wanted, find, I he wanted, was a police officer. Yeah, so. but I didn't know, like, what county. He just said he was a cop. He okay. had his police officer outfit on, uniform on, but I didn't read it. It said Lithonia or Atlanta. So it's just, what county did you live in? I lived in Fulton County. So was he out of his district? No, he was working. So the cops there are allowed to work off-duty jobs okay. in different counties if they want to. Okay. So he was working for a private security firm. Okay. Security, that's when the apartments hired him. Okay. And then, so when did you actually report it? I reported him in October when I seen, no, it was in September. I said, no, it was wait, in October because I waited for a minute. Um, when I seen him on the news, and my god sister that's in Atlanta, she called me. She said, uh, you know, girl, this is that, this is the cop. I think it's the cop. And as soon as they showed the picture, I dropped the phone. I got to shaking. I'm like, what do I do? You know, I, then I felt bad because I, if I would have reported it, it would have never happened to her. I went through so many different changes with it. I didn't, you know, know what to do. Finally, I went to the DA office and I reported it and um and there you're supposed to find support but I didn't find support there I didn't get the support there. and when you say you didn't find support what do you mean um well when I first told the sheriff who brought me upstairs when I told the sheriff she it's not like she was shocked she literally looked at her partner and said oh I knew there was going to be more so wow. I went upstairs and they gave me, I'm not going to put the names to them, but they gave me an investigator that was very nice. Mm -hmm. um, then they put me in a room with all these women. And it wasn't like a support. It wasn't like I'm there for you. It was kind of more like I'm against you. And that's how I felt. And I even told them I felt like that. So I was, you know, I, I told them I was going to fight this until I can't breathe no more. Um, so they were against me. And then when I did the photo lineup, um, they did the, uh, they asked me to come back in the next day. I did a photo lineup where I had told them that I knew him from a scar he had on his forehead. So when they did the photo lineup, everybody else's pictures had the white background. His picture was completely black. They tried to blacken out the scar on his forehead. And, but I'm gonna remember those eyes. I'm gonna yeah. remember him. Not only did they make me do the photo lineup with a messed up piece of paper, they made me come back and do it again with other people in the room. Did they explain to you why? No. They just said, we need you to do it again. So I, I picked them out again. And um, I left. And that's when I kind of felt like they were against me. I felt like for some, I felt like something wasn't right. And I was trying to figure out why are they not for me? And then I found out down the line why. Okay, and, and so, okay, so the this alleged rape happened in 2017, um, in this beginning of December. And you reported it in October of 2019. The statute wasn't even up yet. So do you think that maybe it's possible that they were looking at the time length and you didn't report it? Is that why they could possibly? I could, I thought about that and, that, and you know, I was okay with that if that's, but it's just because of the stuff that I found out down the line, I don't think that was it. I just yeah. don't. So how does it make you feel that they're really not trying to give you the support and trying to help you get this man convicted for what he has allegedly done to you, but yet they want to use your case to try and convict him in other cases. How does that make you feel? Um, it makes me mad. I mean, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm happy that the other women are gonna, you know, if they can help use my case to help another woman, right. I don't have a problem with that. Right. But if my case can help another woman, my case can help me. It, where's your justice, right? Yeah, exactly. and, and that's, and I haven't gotten them yet. So the alleged rape took place 
Did you continue to live in Atlanta afterwards? Of course. Atlanta is gorgeous. I love Atlanta. <laughs> it, I smile every time I think of Atlanta still. Um, I met a lot of people I call family. I don't call them friends. Uh, I love my mom here, but I made a new mom there. Um, <laughs> I have made a lot of friends there um, that know about what happened. So they were my support team. It's just that we were trying to figure out how to go about it. Right. Um, then, but I stayed because to me, it was best for me mm-hmm. and I had to get to know me. And even after that, I would have came back to Minnesota and I would have took that out of everybody, you know, and I wanted to get through it. But, um, I love, even after all this, I still want to move back to Georgia. I love Georgia. I just, I miss it. I miss my friends and the family that I made there. And I just miss the sun. I miss the my, you know, my melatonin was kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how long after did you move back to Minnesota? I moved back to Minnesota, what, a year and a half later? Okay. So I stayed there for a while, even afterwards. I mean, I stayed until I moved back January 11th of 2020. Okay. Okay. All right. And were you ever, so did they ever, like, connect you with, like, any Victim advocacy. No, my my, and I'm gonna say this because it's not hearsay. She say. Okay. My victim advocate. Um, I explained to her how hard it is for African women, American women, to get charges and how they do get treated. And she hit me with that they don't identify me as a black woman. I guess I'm not understanding. Uh, and told me what to come race back. Has to do with it. Um, and told me to come back to Minnesota and tap into my own resources. So you were raped, but you were told by a victim advocate that you don't identify as a black woman, right? So excuse me for what I'm about to say. I'm not prejudiced. (laughs) I have nothing against our uh, white people. But if that's the case, then give you your white woman privileges and convict this man then, right? Yeah, that's how I felt. I ain't gonna, that's what my mom said and she's white. My mom called, told her, if my daughter's not black and I didn't raise a black woman, will give her um, white woman privileges and charge him like she's a white woman here. All right. So I would just like to take a moment mm-hmm. and check in with you because I know this could be overwhelming and it can be very frustrating. And I would just like to ask you, how is your mental health been since this has happened to you and you've been fighting to try to get this alleged rapist prosecuted? I think it's been hard because I feel like um, I got sent back like trash and um, I got sent back being homeless and I had a roof over my head. Um, I left Jordan the day I, I left. It took me two days to throw everything I had did by myself because I came in with nothing. So I left with nothing. Okay. Um, and it's hard because even coming back here, um, you guys sent me back homeless. You sent me back with no support. And you sent me back like I don't even exist no more. Mm -hmm. Like I haven't been to Atlanta. Like it never happened. Um, And that's not fair because if it was up to me, I would have chose to stay in Georgia to fight my case. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting harassed and you got DAs calling you, screaming at you, and you got police coming knocking on your door saying your music's too loud at 3.30 in the afternoon and and it's people that's walking up and down the street complaining, like they're just walking up and down the street and they just, they're saying my music's too loud. It just didn't make sense to me. Um, I felt like my apartment complex, they were starting to bully me, like the lady there. She told me that, um, why didn't you go to the hospital? And all oh, that could never happen to me. And I hate that she said that. And I emailed her and explained to her, that's not, that's not fair because you never know what God can do maybe he could have picked you and maybe God just picked me because I'm stronger and I'm going to stand up for, mm-hmm. you know, what I'm going through. You might have been weak and you never know. You might not be able to make it through what I'm going through, but or there was certain, you know, and I'm not, and I, that's why I said, I still love it. All, all black people ain't the same, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But they are some in Georgia. They do. I can say I've watched homeless people give me support and and 
and it was crazy. You know, homeless people there, they gave me support through what I was going through. I had the Waffle House. They were giving me free breakfast and lunch and dinner just for I could stay there to fight my case. And I had to leave and I left everything and I came back. Now I'm homeless. I'm staying with people and I'm trying to fight this case with everything in my, I don't have money. I didn't ask them for no money. I just want to lock him up and I want him to feel what I feel. He needs to feel everything that I feel. Like he needs my pain back on here. Are you okay to continue with the interview? I'll give you a moment. And so, uh, without the mention of any names, you mentioned the alleged officer was married, is that correct? Yes. And she worked for the DA office, the same office that was supposed to prosecute my case. What I didn't get was if his wife worked for the DA office, by law, that's a conflict of interest. Yep. You were supposed to hand my case right away to the GBI. Instead, you didn't. I want to know why did y'all even move her if no victims came forward yet? They moved her a week after the lady in Lithonia got raped. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact why he was in jail, she was talking to him. There's no way that he should know I'm back in Minnesota. Oh. So the wife found out you were back in Minnesota? Yeah, come to, you know, how do you know that? I've, I have a friend that was, I'm not going to say his name because he, he, he didn't, he put his job at Jeopardy um, that um, was texting me and letting me know if nobody else was keeping me up to date, he was going to keep me up to date. The only thing I have a problem with him is I understand you have a job to me, you're still protecting the blue because you know everything, you know, you know how they're handling the case, you know what they're not doing and you know, if I mean, I want to like release all these text messages and all this stuff because I know for a fact that there's realness to them. Um, but you don't want to stand up. I just like it could have been his daughter. It could have been his mom. I am somebody's daughter. I'm somebody's mom. I'm somebody's grandma. I am all that. And and not to have nobody help you, like nobody. Not that even the DA, like. The ODA, because this is a new DA now, it's the ODA. And from what I know is, and I'm going to say it, and from what I know is he, 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 he protects Mr. Wilborn's wife. Well, okay, so I did my homework and um, I won't mention names, but because I wanted to know why is this officer has these allegations against him? How does he can continue to get hired? So I looked up the person who hired him for the Lithonia Police Department, mm -hmm. and um, his slate's not too clean either. Mm -hmm. And he actually has allegations, as well as the DA. Yeah. So I guess this is just something you know that they do when they just stick to you know. And then on top of that, when he allegedly raped a girl in 2007 in Atlanta when he was a cop. You, the reason why he was able to get hired because they only suspended him and then he resigned. They did not, and if you would have fired him, he would have never been able to become a cop again. You suspended him purposely for that knowledge. You know what I'm saying? So to me, I do feel like somewhat Atlanta is responsible for the stuff that he done finished doing too, because you could have fired him and he could have been fired and he would not have been able to have a badge to hide behind no more. Well, so, but he was charged with the, he hasn't been charged with nothing yet. Well, with the well, lead rape uh, that took place, uh, what was it, a block away from the police department? No, he hasn't been charged. She would, she stopped talking. I know that for a fact. He resigned before they could finish the investigation. So when he resigned, they just stopped the case. The article that I read said he had been charged. No, he wasn't charged, charged. He wasn't charged to where he was doing time. He got probation. Uh, well, you can't get probation without some type of charge, though. Yeah, but he wasn't charged for what he did to her. 
he was just Perfect. only reprimanded for sexual same, sexual misconduct in front of her. He wasn't charged for anything. Literally, if you go back into it, it says that the case that the case was never figured out no more because he resigned right before the investigation um, started. Because they, they feel like if there's no, like they sent me, like I got the text where it says no victim can't prosecute. I'm not there. So they feel like they can't prosecute. He's no longer working for Atlanta. So they're not going to, you know what I'm saying, prosecute. But you guys will look at, he's also married to a cop. So a lot of stuff came into play with that case right there. I just, all I know is for a fact that is the lady did get scared and she stopped talking. And then there was another victim. Well, he didn't actually rape her, but he did perform sexual acts. Oh, you're talking about the lady? In front of her, in her. So that's the one I was talking about. So that one, that one, he didn't get charged. That's the one. Oh, yeah, the one that I said he got charged. He didn't get charged yet. He didn't get charged yet. He's been sitting at home on house arrest. He's been sitting at home. They called me, oh, not even a month ago and asked me, could they use my case to help her case? I felt like her case should have been stronger than my case. He did that in front of somebody. So how is it that you need my case? Because you want to show that he's continuing doing. He keeps doing. And this is what his pattern is. But her, her case has been stronger than all of us because she had somebody there. And she also has somebody to help her report it because she had backup, you know. So she had that support, and I'm glad she did. Why do you think they would support her and not you? Because they, because I was by myself, and and I think Fulton County is different than Lithonia. And the reason why I said it was different because his wife was still working for Fulton County at okay. that time in the DA office. And um, so, Tanta, you said you had some questions. Oh. So many, so many. Shar, I'm so glad to see you today. And I'm so glad that you are moving forward through all of this. I know this has just got to be something that has really caused a lot of stress. And like Ms. Londa said, a lot of mental anguish for you. So I'm so sorry for that, but I'm so happy to see you here and to see you talking about this. But I think I, I have so many questions but I'm gonna start with just, you know, one basic thing that struck me. You said a lot of things, but I was wondering as you were telling your story, when he, after the, after the rape, mm -hmm. when he left and, you know, you had to go pick up your children from school and you went on with your day, but I, I, I was a little confused as to whether or not you saw him again, if he returned back to that, that job. Was, no, they said when I, um, actually I did get the, the, the day that he raped me, he also knew it was his last day at that job. Are so he knew that he would never be seen back in that area again. So, so we could assume that that was a planned thing then. I, yeah. It, uh, we can assume that he kind of watched her move, you know, movement. Yeah. To get, that's that's what it sounds like. Yeah, you know, it, he kinda, it really kinda, does. Kinda comfortable, and then he kind of, I mean, to tell somebody that they have three pairs of jeans, that says that you're watching. Right, that he'd been watching you, but yeah. the fact, as you were telling your story, it just really struck me because you said, you know, he raped you, and then there was that period of time where you had to recover and then you heard about the other allegations and then you went forward and reported it. And I just kept wondering, but where was he in the interim of that? But that was his last day on the job. And so he felt as though he could do something. Yep. That is, that's amazing. I, I just, I'm gonna let other people go ahead and ask you some questions and I'll jump back in. Okay. Did you have questions, Data? Um. No, not really. I just wanted to say that, um, Ms. Sean, you have to be a very strong individual to get up here and express this with us. And I thank you and you are loved. Um, I do have one little bit of question after he did that. Um, when you went to get your kids, were you afraid? Were you? I was looking, I was looking for him. Cause at this point in time, I'm like, I'm just gonna run to the, you know, the school. 
but I also felt like he, you know, he also um, was scared too, you know, right. because he didn't know if I was going to report him or not, you know, so he was also scared too. But when I, um, I was looking for him and ever since, like one thing he taught me was he, he kept, one thing he told me when I was walking the kids to school one day was you should always watch the way you walk and you should walk different ways because you might never know who's watching you. Mm. So that's one thing he installed in my head the whole time I was in Georgia. And um, and I always watch where I walk. I always change different ways up to where I walk. I met some nice black cops. I met an old one. He was nice. Um, when I say he, like on my birthday, he said, it's your birthday, Charlotte. Here go $100. He was an old, old cop. Gave me for, and he never asked me, never knocked on my door. None of that, you know? And, um, and he... Lived. He was working right across the street from at the, the Coca Cola factory, you know, doing a little crosswalk, and he and he was just a nice, you know, man. So, and I told him. So you, what I just realized, a lot of people there too, you know, in Georgia, it's hard to get work. So a lot of people don't want to, you know, say anything too. They want to keep their jobs, and right. and they in um, like at even at the apartment complex, I told somebody. I even asked the lady who does not long, no longer working there. I told her two days after she moved me on there, I said, I need to get back into that, that house, that apartment. I was right by a cop. I need to get that rag that he threw behind the, the washer and I need to be able to cut some of that carpet up. And she was like, oh, they're remodeling it. Come to find out they weren't remodeling nothing. They didn't remodel it until 2019. Oh, they was trying to cover it up. Yeah, clearly, clearly. Can I ask you another question, Shar? Yes, ma'am. When I would just like to know for everybody that's watching, and you know, as women, we always have those inner feelings in our guts that tell us when something's not right or when something's going to go wrong. And a lot of times we ignore those. So I would just like to know from this experience for you, what was the second that you knew something was going to go left? Was when it he, when he walked in your apartment? He, was it when he knocked on your door? It's when he stepped his foot in my door and I didn't ask him to come in. Because and he was he, never in a uniform, correct? Well, when he, was you, in, he was in uniform. He also was in his um, security office, you know, security. He's He always had a weapon on him because, you know, the police in Atlanta, okay. ain't gonna, they don't go nowhere without their weapons in a right. You know, in Fulton County, they definitely don't. So he had his weapon on him. I was able to describe his car. I was able to describe the make the, the his weapon to the, the DA. Um, I was able, um, they found out he was working that day. They found out all this stuff. And to me, I just feel like he's, somehow he's just getting away with stuff. And for some reason, it's just like it's getting covered up. And then even, you know, when he wasn't a cop at a period of time, what was he doing? You know, and that's my thing. Like, I worry, I worry a lot about my me, but then I worry about a lot about the other victims, too, that I feel like there's more and more victims out there. And I wish they would come forward because I feel like, you know, it needs to be told that, you know, you still need to watch your back. You know, even if it's your guards up, you know what I'm saying? And then on top of that, I think it's harder because it is, when you look in society, it's black on black crime. It's not yeah. black on white. It's not white on black, yeah. you know? So do I feel like if he was a white cop that raped me, I feel like he would have been charged. Do you think? Yeah. That, that, that kind of confuses me. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, me too. I, I'm confused I, on that because... Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to make it a black and white yeah. thing, but at the same right. time, this is a black officer. And I, it usually is like, if it was a black cop, he would have been charged. He would have been, uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. to be told by an advocate that she, does, she doesn't identify as black, it's like, okay, you lost me. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I don't get it, you know? I do feel like that. I, I mean, I can't say who sent me the text, you know what I'm saying? I did receive a text from a source that said if he was white, he would have been charged. Maybe it's the climate, too, with everything that's been going on with, you know, officers and the Black Lives Matter movement. Maybe they feel as though that might have, if he had been a white cop, that it would be something that would be more precise. But look, you know, I think, with two, <clears throat> all his victims are black. All oh. black. And he has not been charged for not one of them. 
well, all serial killers and rapists have their types, right? And that's what I said. Yeah. And I think that's just frustrating yeah. because I feel like what I have in my phone, I can't just post everywhere. You know what I'm saying? I right. can send you, I can send you some, you know what I'm saying? But if you read it, you would say my color probably played a role in it. So do you feel that do you feel that if you had a million voices behind you, something would get done? Yeah, I do feel like that. I mean, there's times where I felt like I could just go to Atlanta by myself and just protest down there so they can listen. You know, I feel like that um, I wanted to, you know, a lot of the women down there in Atlanta be aware that these cops, there is cops out there doing it. Black, white, Mexican, right. adults, it matter. they are, you know, raping us as women. But I do feel like just like, you know, uh, as black women, we don't get that support. And, you know, and we don't get that support from our own women either, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, and I know it's hard sometimes for people to, because if you ain't never been through a rape, it's kind of hard to relate, you know, sometimes, right. you know, and right. you want to, you, you kind of look at that person, but I want everybody aware it can happen to anybody. It can that happen to so anybody. So can I ask you, yeah, when you get through, so, so I just want to ask you this one question. So yes. this was to happen. Okay, we're not we're gonna use a different person, but if something was to ever happen to you like this again, would you feel safe and confident enough to pick up the phone and call 911, knowing that an officer did this to you? How do you look at them now? I, I mean, I have a hard time, I'm not gonna lie to you. I do have a hard time with black cops. I, I do. I it it, it that kind of hit me in the core. Um, but I do feel like now that I've been through this, now I know that you, you know, you take those, you take those risks. I mean, you're taking highly big risks calling the police on the police, you know, um, yeah. you, you yeah. taking that where, yeah. or is your case going to be hard? You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, you're taking that risk or they, his friend, you know, they could put you in the back of a car, take you somewhere, you know, because mm. you don't you, you take those risks. Now, I feel like I did the right thing with Georgia. I did that because of what I know now, of what I know now with this man and his wife and the people that's behind them. I feel like I did the right thing. I felt like my life would have been at jeopardy if I would have um, reported it in 2017. Right but now I would change, you know what I'm saying? If anything, if, or I would be, if it happened in Minnesota, of course I have support, you know what I'm saying? I can call my family up and say, hey, come with me to the doctor's office and grab my kids. I was more concerned right. about my two babies than anything because this man even knew what schools they went to and he knew their names. He so, was watching y'all. And so um, the information you share with him, does that make you leery now about sharing so much information, even if it's just not a police officer sharing personal, yeah. so much yeah. personal yeah. information yeah. with someone you don't really yeah. know? Okay. Yeah, it does. It makes you, I used to be open about my life because I wanted people to learn from it, but now it makes you kind of shut down from it because people can use it against you. And that's what I learned with him is that he, he used it against me. Everything that I talked to him personally about just my struggles in Georgia, and everything he used it against me to get what he wanted. Yeah. Ladies, have any more? Uh, can I ask you one more question? So, if a uh, if a young lady was to reach out to you that was in the same situation that you was in, would there be like any kind of um, encouragement words that you can give her? I would, no. tell her stay, I would tell her to stay strong and keep her head up. I will also give her my phone number. I don't care what time of day, night it is. You're going to want to talk to somebody, you know. Um, I would tell her to, you know, not to never give up, regardless of what people tell you. You don't give up. You, because you're not a, people say go to a survivor, but how are you a survivor until you can get justice for what happened to you? That's when you become a survivor. You know, right. but I would I would definitely um let them know never to give up, pray on it, cause God is wonderful. You know what I'm saying? God can yes. God can handle all that, you know. Yes. And that's what made me turn him in is I was scared, but I felt like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, It's time. It's time for you to stand up and 
And now I have a voice that I can use for other, you know, other women. I don't care if it's not just his that cop, if it's any cop. You call, you need to call the police. If you have to, if you're scared to call the police, you know what I say? Call the FBI because they'll take it first, you know? Well, so the FBI is working on your case. And how are they helping? <laughs> so <laughs> the GBI is working on my case too. And um, let's just say, I feel like I'm in this on the long run by myself. Um, I don't have words with them. I'm not, they know how I feel. They know that I'm not backing down. They know that I'm fighting this regardless. I think they have enough um, stuff to prosecute them on everybody. You know, I just think that um, to me, I feel like at this point, they should just put all the victims together and just charge them. Um, you, they try to do what I'm being honest. They try to do what R. Kelly and Bill Cosby. I mean, why is, you know, I'm just being honest. They say that, and I said this to the lady, I said, and I was being honest. I said, so they don't have, they didn't go to the hospital, but them men were sitting behind bars for, for a long time. And this man is sitting at home, flicking his TV channel with a, with a bracelet on, living his happy life. And, and it's not fair. And then I realized that also, I, it's just, it's not fair, but I also know that his wife does play, uh, to me, I feel like plays a big role in this situation. Well, I think it's bigger mm -hmm. from the research so I you, have. You have the Atlanta Police Department that have investigated. You've got the FBI that have investigated. Did you say the Georgia Bureau of Investigation as the well? The Georgia Bureau of Investigation is doing it now, but um, she's so hard to get. I finally asked her to, because... I know she hasn't looked at some of the text messages that she received because if mm -hmm. she did, she would have had the answers I was asking her. Um, so I just feel like, but she's the one that called me and said, oh, I gave your number to the DA in Lithonia so he can use your case to help fight this case. So I have, a I have question. another question for you too. Okay. I'm just curious in the time, in those three days that you guys were communicating and he was mm -hmm. clearly trying to get to know you and yeah. figure out if you would be his next victim. But did you ever exchange numbers? And if you okay. did, have you heard from him directly no, since the rape? He never gave me his number or anything. He just talked to me when he sees me walking the kids back and forth from the school. Okay. So I have, I have a question, this data. So have you got in touch with any other uh, of the other victims? That well, they won't have encountered they, or they won't allow you to get a contact not, with them. They won't allow me because, I mean, at the end of the day, because I think, to me, I'll probably be the backbone, the stronger one of all of them because I do feel like, you know, I'm not scared of them. Scared of, even sending me back to Minnesota, you just kind of made my ump go harder, you know? Right. So, um, but um, they no, they won't. I wish they would. Cause I feel like we we do know one thing. He all he says to er, to every time he gets busted, he says that it's consensual. Okay, well, I seen a stack of papers, and I'm gonna say I know out of those stack of papers, everybody wasn't consensual. Right. You know, um, and then on top of that, you you know is he, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he also know I would keep doing it too if I feel like I have protection. I feel like I'm never going to get locked up. I feel like, you know, I would keep continuing doing it because you got, he's got protection. Well, also he's an officer. So he mm -hmm. knows the steps to take to not cause he's himself yeah. to get mm -hmm. caught up. You know what I yeah. mean? So. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, is there any more questions? Does anybody have any more questions? Man. I have, um, a comment from someone. It's kind of personal. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, so she asked, even though you didn't report it right away because you were scared, did you at any time just to be sure get tested for STDs or Yes, HIV? yes, I've been tested. 
Uh, that's one thing I have been tested. And everybody, I'm going to make this clear. I'm just going to say this. When you go to Atlanta, they got testy swabs right on each corner. You can yes, get swab. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can you know, be healthy I'm, here if you want to. I just want to make that clear to everybody. <laughs> you know? But no, I've been tested and um, I've been clean of everything. Um, I got tested while I was at Emory, you know, at Emory Hospital. It came back negative. I got tested again here. It came back negative. I know I don't have it, but I'm going to keep continue getting tested regardless because that's what you're supposed to do in life. But, but because I do know for a fact that they said uh, allegedly he has raped prostitutes too. So, um, and I don't get, I don't care if they were, but you still did it, you know. So at the end of the day, it does not matter who they are. Yeah, um, there. If, if no means no. If I didn't I, give you, I, then hey, it's it not violate my body to take advantage of me in any type of way. And so, um, I just have uh, a couple more questions, but I did want to say that you have done an awesome job of being able to sit here and tell your story. Um, it shows how strong you are, and. Uh, I'm glad to see you fight and I want you to continue to fight. And I wanted to ask you, how would you handle your situation differently? I would, um, I think definitely now I would, I know now I wouldn't reach out. I think most definitely I would reach out to um, the FBI before I reach out. I think that if you do get raped by a cop, the best thing to for you to do is reach out to the FBI because you don't really want to be, I feel like reaching out to their department, mm -hmm. it, that, you know, it is, you might not go the way you want, you it know, some type yeah. Of conflict. yeah, because I mean, you're still, cause you got still, even that's why I say it was a conflict of interest. I mean, his, they should have never took my case in full automatically the day I walked in, it should have been, you know what, we're going to, we're going to hook you up with the FGBI and here it goes, you know what I'm saying? It should have been never handled in their, he wouldn't even give the file over to GBI. He would not give my file over about the D. Are they able to do that? Can they refuse to do that? If you know who the old DA is, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hmm. All right. And so I think uh, Miss Snee asked, asked this question What would be your advice to another woman? So in just in if any rape situation, find someone that you can talk to. Um, make sure you do get tested if you can't, because I'm not gonna say that every woman can go get tested. You know what I'm saying? Just make sure you report it. Make sure that you're safe when you report it. You know, um, because your pedophiles do have friends. They do, you know. They, once you start pressing charges, your, their friends come out, their team may, you know, like I had, a, like we had marked cars in our parking lot. Oh, wow. So, um, my friends, I was trying to figure out why my friends, my friends were protecting me there and I didn't even know it, you know? So, um, but yeah, I feel, you know, I would, and then also get the support. Like I start counseling tomorrow for the first time, you know, thanks to, you know, Miss Londa over here, I start counseling tomorrow for the first time. So then that way I can get what I'm going through because I, I I I feel like I have a, a hard time with black men right now. You know, um, I might not respect them the way I should, and it's just something I have to get over with. It's my PTSD, you know, so I just have to get over it. What about cops in general? I don't like cops. Um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish. I mean, I feel that there's good cops and there's bad cops. I'm not going to sit here and say all cops are bad. Mm -hmm. All cops are, you know, they do this. There is good cops. I mean, I have a good cop that was helping me. I just wish he would have helped me more. You know, um, spoke out. he would have spoke out instead of texting me. You could have, you could have said this to the people you needed to talk to. Well, I know that you said that earlier that. You know, when you came to Atlanta, you felt like there was a lot of African-American support here in this city. And I can agree. I, I live here and I love the city for that. Have you reached out to any of those kind of groups to find support in, you know, fighting this particular case or helping you with that? I know, like when I was in Georgia, I mean, I had 
if I, I think if I would have been able to find a safe place to stay, would have been I would have been able to find them there. But at that point in time, when people are telling you to leave and go home and you're not from there, you know, you just kind of, you kind of left. I just left. Um, but I do, I mean, like, I ain't gonna lie, I've, I've, I got support there, you know, here. I, yeah, I'm just now getting their support. But here, I'm not gonna lie, it's been hard to get support here. So, but um, I've, there... I mean, I ain't gonna lie, this, that's where I want to be back at after all this is over with anyways. I, even during it, I still want to come back. I call Georgia my home, y'all. <laughs> so it's a great place. It's they a great place. Say, Usually. Back here, that they knew that it would be kind of harder for you to yeah. try to prosecute. And I think, I kind of think that was their motive. Yeah. Yeah, because of the, don't have to deal with me. Like I asked her, I knew the apartment complex. The apartment complex was on the verge of bullying me because of everything. And so I asked my the victim advocate lady, like, is there any programs that can help me? Because they were raising my rent up. Like, is there any programs that can help me? Can you help me move? You know, just get me into a safe area. She said no, because that'd be like them paying for me to stay to fight my case. Mm. So, if you ladies don't have any more questions, are you guys done? No, I'm going to say be blessed and stay strong and keep your head up. And um, don't let that tear you down or break you down. You stay focused on you and your children. You stay prayed up and you pray about it. And you keep on pushing and you keep on fighting. So, Absolutely. that's what I want to say to you. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Not be crying. Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> just know you got some support sis yes yes yeah. you do and if you find yourself in this Atlanta yeah. area again I definitely believe get my contact me. information from Miss Londa there and reach believe out me. I'm coming back I love it there <laughs> <laughs> How is it? These, but you know you got to be careful because you see I'm getting ate up out here so she, she, asked me, she asked me about the lawyer thing so i guess it's been and you know and i guess it's hard if, if you're from you're from atlanta you know who the oda is do you know who the oda is right? i don't i i read yeah after so your story yes. he has a lot of he has a lot of people there behind him so when i was looking for lawyers i think they were more scared to touch that than anything yeah. um because of how strong he is mm-hmm. and um and then on top of that, because of, you know, they a lot of people want to keep Atlanta Hollywood. They don't want it to be known as everything that, that's coming. Yeah. They don't want it to be known that this could happen to you. They'd rather shut it down than make it bright, you know, because they want you to come visit, spend your money, party, you know, yeah. and do everything there. And, you know, so, but I just want, like, when, when women tell me that they're leaving to Georgia to come, you know, there, I always say, be careful. Just because they're a cop, white or black, you need to be careful. Because there is a lot of people that use that badge to get what they want. We have to and use the good that we were given, crazy. no matter who it is. Because yeah. everybody is human. Doesn't matter what uniform they're wearing. Yes. They're yeah. all mm-hmm. human. We have to be you weird. Don't have to you get that intuition. That intuition is in the blink of power. Yes. Mm-hmm. Abuse of power. power. That's right. Yeah, a, a lot of it. Yeah. You were saying something, Miss Sneed? Yeah, I wanted to say something, but I got kind of paused up. Like, do I really want to say that on air? But I'm going to say this to you, right? The reason why I keep saying what I'm saying to you is, I was one of them females who got assaulted by a police officer in jail. The man tried to make me suck his wee-wee and I wasn't going. I refused to put my mouth on anything. So he forced me to jack leg him off and wiped it out of my hand, uh, put it in his pocket and um, made me wash my hand. And at the time I was like 14, 15 and I was scared because I could have yelled out for help, but at the time I didn't know no better. So thank you for speaking up because it's people like me who didn't speak up and didn't know how to speak up. And it's people like you that's going through the same thing I went through. So I'm gonna tell you to keep fighting for it. Keep fighting, sis. Wow. Keep 
in the world. So already you've, you've reached out and touched somebody, Miss Sneed. Wow. Yeah. So I would like to commend you and thank you for joining us this evening. And I hope you keep fighting. And any, any, if there's any way that I can continue to help you, I'm here. You know that. And uh, we're gonna go on and end this. Thank you, ladies, for joining. You guys I have you a hug. I see you a big hug. Oh, big hug. Too. Yeah, yeah. 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 And stay strong and um yeah y'all <laughs> stay blessed stay blessed y'all bye stay bye. Blessed. bye bye see y'all